Well, good morning, church. This certainly isn't the way that I wanted things to play out over the past few weeks, but God is sovereign in this, and we definitely trust His goodness throughout. Uh, This is not church. As I said last week, it's a crutch at best. It's a crutch that hopefully will help us be able to gather again next week. And speaking of next week, the plan right now is to not have Sunday school, just to have our morning gathering at 1030 in the morning. That will be January the 2nd, and that will be at 1030 again. So hope to see you there. Continue to pray for those who are sick in our church And I'm praying by next week that uh, everyone will be well and on the mend and ready to gather again. Well, we're going to be in John chapter 1 this morning. I want to finish up the series that we've started here during Advent or during the Christmas season. I think it's a very appropriate passage considering we are the day after Christmas at this point. When people think about God, they have different concepts of God. There are some people, I don't mean to be... Uh, flippant or blasphemous about this in any way, but there are some people who see him as the man upstairs. Some people see God as grandpa. Some people see him as a domineering manager. Some see him as a detached maker, someone who created everything, spun it off into existence, and then leaves it alone. Some people see God as a strict, hyper-detailed rule maker. And the thing about who God is and what he is like is It's not something that we have to worry about. We actually are going to see it in this passage today. As we study the Bible, we realize that Jesus reveals to us who God is. Let's look at it here in John chapter 1. We're going to see who God is. We're going to see who Jesus is. And it is glorious. It is grand. It is great. We're going to pick up in verse 14. We left off with verse 13 last week. And the Word became flesh. Again, John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. I am really, really sad that we're not face to face today for us to look at this passage together. I believe that this is one of the most important messages that I will ever preach as the pastor of Greenwood Baptist Church. And even as it's one of the most important messages I will probably ever preach, I don't know that I've ever felt my inability to describe the truth that God has before us. I've never felt that inability like I feel it now. So I'm going to ask God to help me. And if you would surrender your heart and your mind to the scripture here today and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you and uh, to you through his word, and that your life would be brought in line with the truth that we hear here today. Father, I come in the name of Jesus, and I am desperately in need of your help. Holy Spirit, would you come magnify Jesus? Fill me. Uh, Fill me to overflowing. I pray that you would clothe me in your power, that I would not speak with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Lord, for my brothers and sisters and friends, would you show them the glory of the truth that's here? Reveal to us the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would do this for the fame of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. If you were to uh, distill this down to a thought, a truth that we can take home, and it's a truth that I hope finds really, really deep root in our hearts, it would be this. Jesus' coming reveals God's overflowing grace. Jesus' coming reveals God's overflowing grace. Remember the background of what we've been looking at here. In the first five verses, we saw the coming of the Word, or specifically, we saw the fact that the Word was at the beginning. Jesus was with God, as God, eternally coexistent with God. Then last week in verses 6 through 13, we saw the preparation for Jesus. 
you can say that this is kind of a parenthetical. This is how Jesus came or the preparation that came through John the Baptist and then the response of the world to Jesus and the response of his people to Jesus. And we saw this great truth there that through Jesus, we have the right to become God's children. Now, what's happening here in verses 14 through 18 is John is moving back to the main purpose of this prologue, this introduction to the book of John. And as he moves back to the main purpose, he is going to tell us the astounding truth that this God who had existed in eternity past, Jesus, the Word, this God came to dwell with us. This God came to be with us. We call this the incarnation. And that word incarnation, if you were to break it down in, in, in Latin, it actually speaks of coming in flesh. As we see the coming of Jesus in the flesh, we see a passage that drips with the grace of God from beginning to end. As John 1 unfolds, this is what we see. We see, first of all, that Jesus became like us. Look at verse 14. And the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. Now, we've met the preexistent Word, the, the one who had existed with God from the beginning, the one who had existed as God from the beginning, Jesus. We've met Him, but what John is now telling us is, is that this Word took on skin. It is how God has fully expressed Himself to us. What does this mean, to take on flesh? Well, throughout the history of the church, there are people who have looked at this different ways. There are some people who said that he came to dwell in man. And that's not what the passage says. It says that he became flesh. There are some who would say that he came to appear like a man. But that's not what the passage says. John says that he became flesh. There are some who say that God picked a man and then kind of possessed that man and made that man his son. Nope, that's not what the passage says. The passage says that he became flesh. Every major heresy that has popped up in church history about the nature of Jesus has flowed from our human inability or our unwillingness to believe that Jesus, God, became flesh, fully God and fully man. Him, Jesus, becoming flesh is stunning. See, when John says that he became flesh, there are two ideas behind this. There's the literal idea, the literal idea that he became skin and bones like this, but also a metaphorical idea and that flesh throughout the scripture speaks of human nature. Jesus took not just the skin of humanity, but the nature of humanity. This is incomprehensible. I mean, the condescension of this is so stunning. This coming down of God in the flesh. This isn't like, y'all you know, know Harry and Meghan, Queen Elizabeth's son and daughter-in-law. It's not like Harry and Meghan saying, well, we're not going to be royalty anymore and we're going to come over here to America and go to Hollywood and still live our rich and famous lifestyle. It's not this. When we see the coming of Jesus in the Gospels, this is like Queen Elizabeth II leaving the throne of England and coming down and living as a commoner in the slums of London. Jesus takes on our flesh, but he takes on our nature. That means that he experienced and knew everything about humanity. He experienced, he took on all of humanity and all that that entails except for sin. He experienced pain. He experienced sorrow. He experienced joy. He experienced sadness. He experienced hunger. He experienced sickness. He experienced emotion. He experienced poverty. And he even experienced death. Why? Well, the book of Hebrews tells us. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Who is he talking about? Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The fact that Jesus became flesh is him saying, come to me. We can draw near to him because he knows all that we have known. He has experienced all that we have experienced. But that's not all, all that John says here. John says that the word became flesh, and then he uses another word. The word became flesh, he says, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. You could say that the word tabernacled among us. This word dwelt means to pitch a tent. It's an intentional picture that's being drawn here by John. This word, when he used it, would have brought... Clear images to the mind of Jewish readers. Why? Well, because the word was also a word that was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's the same word that was used for tabernacle. And it's used later on of the Feast of Tabernacles. This word would have been the word that they would have thought of in the Old Testament of the tabernacle. What was the tabernacle in the Old Testament? The tabernacle is where God came and He dwelt among His people. You remember when Egypt came, or Israel came out of Egypt. As they wandered around through the wilderness, there was a portable tabernacle that had been set up. And that's where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt among His people. Only Moses could go in there. Only Aaron could go in there. And they went in there alone. The people, they would encircle that tabernacle, but they never went near it. It is where the presence of God dwelt. And now what John is telling us is is that God is not coming to us as He came to Israel with a tabernacle distant to where only a few can approach Him. He is coming to us as one of us. Israel met God at their tabernacle. Now God is coming to meet us in the person of Jesus Christ, not distant, but with us, like us. A God who is able to be handled. A God who is able to be hugged. A God who is able to hug us. The God who is moved by our plight. If there's any doubt that God understands and knows what we're going through, that is all erased and removed when we think about the Word becoming flesh and tabernacling or dwelling among us. The Word tabernacled among us. And then we see that the Word shows us God's glory. Look at what John says in verse 14. We have seen His glory. Now, you've got to back up a little bit. Remember John... The writer of this book was one of the big three of the disciples that were with Jesus, and he saw the glory of Jesus. He saw the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus, his, his appearance was changed, and the, the glory that was kind of veiled by this humanity was seen by John. But he's talking about something even beyond that. He says that the glory of God has been revealed in Christ. We have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Don't miss this. In the Old Testament, the glory of God dwelled in the tabernacle. The very presence of God dwelled in that tabernacle. And what John is saying now is that glory is no longer in a tabernacle, and this would be important to those Jews because by the time John was writing this, The temple had in all likelihood been destroyed. And so the presence of God as they viewed it was no longer there because the temple was gone. And John is saying, hey, you think of God and the concept of Him dwelling in a building, in a place. I'm telling you that God came and He tabernacled a different way in the person of Jesus Christ. This glory here refers to God's nature. All that He is, the sum of His qualities... Everything about God, His glory, His goodness, His love, His righteousness, His holiness, all of those things, all of that is part of His glory, and all of that is wrapped up in Jesus. And when we see Jesus, we see the nature of God. God, God or John uses a picture here. He says that it is of the Son, as of the only Son from the Father. He's saying that this is like a Son reflects his father. Last week, I was watching a golf tournament. I know some of you, your eyes immediately glazed over as soon as I said golf. I was watching a golf tournament. It was a very interesting tournament. 
It was the return of Tiger Woods to the golf course after an accident that he had had. But it was an interesting tournament because in this tournament, it's called a pro-am, and you would have the professional golfer playing with an amateur golfer, and the amateur golfer who happened to be playing with Tiger was his son, Charlie. And you can look this up. There are several videos on the internet that, that highlighted how much Charlie was like his dad. His mannerisms were the same. Tiger, when he would walk down the golf course, he wouldn't, uh, if he needed to kind of wipe his nose, he wouldn't do it like this. Tiger would always, he would do this. He'd kind of wipe his nose like that. Tiger, whenever he'd come up for a golf shot, he'd get his golf club ready, and this is what he'd do. He'd pull his shirt up like this, you know, just kind of getting it loose and ready to go. And then when he would, he would uh, hit a putt, he would line up like this, and as he hit the putt, if it was about to go in, he'd stick his golf club out like this, watching it go in. And you could watch his son, Charlie, Charlie out on the golf course walking down. He's doing this. Charlie, before he hits the ball, he's doing this. Charlie, as the ball is about to go in, he's doing this. He is a reflection of his father, but he's an imperfect reflection of his father because he's not exactly like him. Like him. But what we know from the Scripture is, is that Jesus is the exact imprint of the glory of God. We know from the Scripture that the radiance of Christ is the exact likeness of God in every way. Jesus is perfect and exact in his replication of God because he himself is God. So when you see Jesus, you see God. We cannot divide them. We can't view Jesus as someone who's full of grace and Jesus or God is the meaning. No, they are the same people. Different people, sorry, but they are the same God, part of the Godhead. And so when we see Jesus, we're seeing God. And this begs the question, if God is going to come and reveal himself in this way, if God is going to come and meet man, how would he come? What would he be like? When God comes to meet man, would he be highfalutin and rich? When God comes to meet man, would he be stern and harsh? I mean, God, when he came to be a man, he would have every right to be uh, to live a life of extravagance. When God came to meet man, he would have every right to be stern and harsh. Think about it. The holy God, the creator of the universe, dwelling among dirty, wicked, self-absorbed men. God would have every right, in the person of Jesus Christ as he comes to us, he would have every right to be like a strict, mean drill sergeant inspecting the troops and yelling at them for their our unpolished boots and our dirty uniforms. He would have every right to highlight and demean our inadequacies. And sadly, that is the picture that some people have of God. But that is not the picture that emerges from John chapter 1. That's not the picture of God. That's not the picture of Jesus that emerges from the New Testament. Not in any way. Jesus became flesh. God became flesh. Jesus became flesh. But Jesus became flesh, next we see, to show us grace. Verses 14 through 17. The Word became flesh. He dwelt among us. Look down at verse, um, at, at the end of verse 14. He was the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, for from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace so he came, we see first of all, full of grace and truth. This word full means to the brim, all the way to the brim. What does it mean when he says grace? Well, grace, the word we know, refers to God's kindness to men. Kindness that not one of us deserves. We are his enemies. We are rebels who are full of sin, wreaking havoc on his good creation. We don't deserve anything from God. But grace is God's kindness towards us. Truth here refers to who God is, who we are, what He expects of us, and what we need. Now consider how Jesus came. It says that He came full of grace and full of truth. He was full of both of those things. Now, some Christians major in truth. That's what they lead with. They major in truth, and if we do that, we have to understand that we forget or minimize grace and we are out of balance. 
And then there are some Christians who major in grace and minimize truth. And if we ever minimize truth, we are out of balance. But I would urge you, as you look at this passage and the rest of the New Testament, that the main quality, the main and driving quality that emerges from the person of Jesus Christ is grace. See, here's the thing. If you are a believer, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you know and I know what colossal screw-ups we are. I mean, for the believer, especially our, our conscience convicts us and condemns us on a regular basis. Every day for me is a walk in my own inadequacy. Every day for me is anger at my sin and my inability to get my act together because I know who God is and I know what He asks of me and I know what He requires of me. And every day is an exercise in futility in my flesh when I look at who I am. And if we're not careful, we will project our feelings about us on Jesus. And we will think that Jesus and God see us the way that we see ourselves. We want to get to the point, or if we ever get to the point, that we don't feel that way, our inadequacy and our inability and our sinfulness and our wickedness and our brokenness. If we ever get that way, do you know what we need? We need a good dose of truth. Turn over to 1 John and look at what John again says. In 1 John 1, he talks about the coming of Jesus. And he actually puts it in terms of we have handled him, we have, we have touched him, the word. But he's going to go even beyond that. Look at, look at how he puts it here in 1 John 6, verse 8. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice what? The truth. He says, so if we're sinning, and we're not willing to acknowledge that. We don't have fellowship with God. It doesn't mean we've lost our salvation. We don't have fellowship with God is what he's saying. We're not walking in truth. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But here's the thing. Yes, we can get that way sometimes as Christians. And we need the Word of God to show us our inability, our sinfulness, our shortcomings. But most of us don't live there not acknowledging that. Most of us live there acknowledging that. And when we live there focused on that, we miss out on the very reason that Jesus came. Let's never forget the purpose of truth. Truth is who God is, who we are, what God expects, and what we need. But truth is meant to drop us off at the feet of Jesus. Truth is meant to drive us to the cross where love and mercy meet. Look at what verse 17 says back in 1 John 1. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There was grace in the Old Testament in the law. That grace was seen in the sacrifices, the fact that they could sacrifice and that they could have a temporary restoration with God. But that restoration was temporary and it was meant to land us at the feet of Jesus and leave us with Jesus. John, verse 15, prepared the way. Now let me give you a little parenthetical here. This is interesting. John bore witness about him. He cried out, This is he of whom I said... He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Oh, wait a minute. John was born before Jesus. How was Jesus before John? Well, Jesus outranked John because Jesus existed before John. That is a statement from John the Baptist. Again, of the pre-existence of Jesus, the fact that he was God. So John is preparing the way. The, the law, we read later on, is preparing the way for Jesus. John, or sorry, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Paul says that the purpose of the law, it is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The schoolmaster was the person who would take a child and drop him off at school in those Roman times. 
Jesus or the law is the one who just shows us our inability and our need and just leaves us at the feet of Jesus. So what happens when we are left at the feet of Jesus? What happens when we understand who we are in the law? What happens when we understand by the truth what we actually are? Well, this passage in the New Testament shows us that now with Jesus, the dominant quality of God's dealing with man is grace. Not to the neglect of truth, but to bring hope behind truth. Grace is the heart of God dealing with us. If there's any doubt about that, look at verse 16. For from His fullness, speaking of Jesus, this is John the Apostle speaking again, for from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Jesus came to give grace upon grace. From His fullness, the core of who He is, He brings grace. Grace for grace. Grace in place of grace. This, this preposition here, grace upon grace, the word upon. It was a word of exchange. It means to take away and to replace. It's not grace that is given to us. It's not that Jesus gives us grace at salvation and then says, now you're saved. Get your act together from me if you want me to help you and like you. You know, I have heard preaching all throughout my life with preachers yelling at me, telling me to get my act together, and maybe if I got my act together, that somehow or another, God might intervene and be willing to help me at that point. If I could ever get everything all lined up, then the Spirit could come in and help me. But that's not the way that God deals with us. Grace upon grace. Think of it this way. It's like a, a dresser that's full, that's stocked full of clothes. And this is stocked by someone who loves you. Everything that you could need would be in there. Shirts for every occasion. Socks for every occasion. Underwear for every occasion. T-shirts for every occasion. Pants for every occasion. Whatever you need. More than you could ever wear in one day. So you get up. And because you have so much, you wear several changes of clothes. And they get dirty. And that person who loves you doesn't come to you then and get mad at you and tell you that you need to wash your own clothes and then put them back. No, you know what happens? The next morning you wake up and all those clothes have been removed and a whole new batch of clothes, shirts, pants, underwear, socks, t-shirts, shorts, whatever it is you need, those have been put back in. And it's stocked and ready to go. You didn't even use all the ones that you had yesterday. But there's new ones there today. And the next day, the same thing happens. Everything taken out and new put in. Day after day, you don't use all that you had, but there is new there to replace it. It could also be like a refrigerator that is stocked full. And you go and you use different ingredients throughout the day and you drink different things out of it and you wake up the next morning and guess what? All that has been taken away and new food has been brought in. Everything that you could possibly need or want restocked to the gills. Or it could be like the waves of the ocean. Here comes one wave. Well, that's enough. No, here comes another. Unrelenting over and over and over and over again. You go to the beach on vacation. You go to bed. You wake up in the middle of the night. You walk out on the balcony. Guess what's still happening? Wave after wave after wave. You go back to bed. You wake up again in the morning. What's still happening? Wave after wave after wave. Never stopping. It's not wrath and judgment that God says comes to the believer like this. Wave after wave of judgment and condemnation. It's grace. It's what marks His every dealing with us. You know, if you doubt this, I've got a challenge for you. Read the Gospels from beginning to end through this lens and see if you get any other picture of Jesus other than Him dealing with with grace, with those who are sinners. The only people that you see Jesus being rough with are those who are self-righteous and who won't acknowledge their need of Him. Think about it. God came to us as one of us. That's grace. Think about it. God died for us to satisfy His holy requirements for every sin that we ever committed. That's grace.
Think about it. God gives us eternal life with Him through forgiveness. That's grace. God walks with us every day, calling us to Himself, helping us, giving us power. That's grace. Or the way that Paul puts it in Ephesians. Turn over there to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at the way Paul describes God's grace here. In Him, verse 7, Ephesians 1, 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. He says He's got a richness, uh, a storehouse of His grace, which He lavished upon us with all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ. And then He goes on to say, a plan to unite us back with God, all things united in Christ. Grace lavished upon us. Now, I want to be clear. This isn't license, the right to sin without care. It's just a realization that God has done it all, that grace has brought us this far, and it's grace, not our effort, that is going to lead us home. Our sin should drive us to the wide open, compassionate arms of Jesus Christ. Turn back to 1 John. I love what John says here. Again, he's Chapter 1, he's talked about sin. We need to acknowledge that we have sin and that we are sinful. By the way, in verse 9, he says that if we do sin, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. I write these things to you little children that you do not sin or that you sin not. No one here is saying that we ought to sin in any way. No one here is is, uh, minimizing the, the holiness of God. No one here is saying that we ought to give in to one bit of wickedness. John says that we we shouldn't sin. Do not sin. But then this is what he says. You know, it's the reality of who we are. If anyone does sin, the end of verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When we sin... What should be the response to run to our advocate, to run to our attorney, Jesus Christ the righteous, who then covers us with His grace and righteousness so that God the Father, when He sees us, He doesn't see what we've just done. He sees the righteousness and forgiveness of Christ. Grace is the overriding character of this age. You know, I told you earlier that in the Old Testament, God tabernacled among His people. Well, in Jesus, God tabernacled with His people. And then Jesus, after, after He died and after He rose again and after He ascended into heaven, He sent the Holy Spirit. And get this, God now tabernacles in His people, ministering the power and help of Jesus to us. And here's the great truth in this. One day, God will tabernacle with His people eternally in perfect, unfettered, glorious harmony. Turn over to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, look at verses 3 through 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place. Same word as Jesus dwelt with us. The dwelling place. The tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be His people and God will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor any crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This is all because of Jesus bringing grace upon grace to us. You know, parents, as you deal with your kids, and it has taken me years to understand this, I regret so much the picture of God that I painted to my children for years and years and years. Parents, Your job in this is to teach them the truth. Yes, your job is to use the law to reveal who they are. Yes, but if that isn't continually driving them to the grace of Jesus and who He is, we're mistaken. Many of you have been reading the book Gentle and Lowly. I love what Dane Ortland says in this. You can find this on page 100. What is it that children or the children whom we greet in the hallways of our church need most deeply? Yes, they need friends and encouragement and academic support and good square meals. 
But might it be that the truest need, the thing that will sustain them and oxygenate them when all other vital needs go unmet is a sense of the attractiveness of who, of who Jesus is for them, how he actually feels about them? With our own kids, if we are parents, what's our job? That question could be answered with a hundred valid responses. But at the center, our job is to show our kids that even our best love is a shadow of a greater love, to put a sharper edge on it, to make the tender heart of Christ irresistible and unforgettable. Our goal is that our kids would leave the house at 18 and be unable to live the rest of their lives believing that their sins and their sufferings repel Christ because they don't. He came into that to save us from that. Your lost co-workers and family, yes, bring them the truth, but show them the grace upon grace that we have in Christ. We should be the most joy-filled, gracious people that any unbeliever ever meets. Why? Because we have received grace upon grace, and we are simply pointing them to the fountain of grace that we know final thing that we see in this in verse 18 is that Jesus came to show us God no one has ever seen God the only God who is at the father's side he has made him known John says that no one has seen God in the old testament there were glimpses and and hints of God but his nature wasn't fully yet revealed in Jesus guess what there are no more hints there are no more shadows there's nothing that's hidden anymore he says it this way the only god speaking of jesus what a statement of the deity of jesus the only god has made him known what does it mean when he says that he's made him known the word in the original language means to exegete to explain That's what I've tried to do with this passage. I've tried to exegete it. I've tried to explain it to you. What a wonderful picture Jesus reveals to us of God. What a wonderful way Jesus explains God to us. God became flesh. Someone said that the logos, speaking of the Word, the Word does not show us a God who is serenely detached, but a God who who is passionately involved, a God who brings wave upon wave of undeserved grace to us. You know, I just don't know if there's any better way the day after Christmas to describe the truth that we celebrated yesterday at Christmas. The incarnation, God becoming flesh, showing us God. A God from whose fullness gives us grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace and you could go infinity with the graces because there's no end to it. There's no bottom to it. You know, when we leave a passage like this, this is the question I would ask you, dear brother or sister, if you are a believer who is part of Greenwood Baptist Church, can I ask you, what is your view of God? And this incarnation truth here should reset our image of God. It's possible that your view of God needs to be recalibrated. What view of God are you giving your children? What view of God are you giving your family members? What view of God are you giving your co-workers? What view of God are you giving the world? If you haven't followed Jesus, Here's a dose of the truth that we talked about. Ephesians 2 says that you're the enemy of God, that you're separated from Him. Uh, Romans 6, 23 says that you are facing the wages, the consequences, the just payment of your sin. That's death. Not just physical death, but eternal separation from God. Your eternity is destined to be consumed with fire. That same passage continues that God is offering a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. He is offering you this gift. It's eternal life. A gift that's made possible by the incarnation. 
And any believer who is watching this, any person who has trusted Christ, the way that they got to that point wasn't by what they did, it's that they trusted Jesus. He did become flesh. He died taking the penalty for their sin. He took our poverty so that we could be rich in Christ. He lavished His grace on us. And any Christian who you meet is that way, not by what they've done, but by who they've trusted. And everything that I've described here today about our relationship with God, that can be your relationship with God as well. One that is... or that stems from grace not one that stems from judgment because of your sin. I would encourage you to reach out to me. WMDavis78 at gmail.com Send me an email. Let's talk about it. Uh, Believer, I'm going to pray here in just a moment. And when I pray, would you recalibrate your thinking about God if it needs to be? And if it's already lined up with His Word, just sit and bask and behold and the glory that we see in Jesus and the nature of God that is revealed to us, one that is full of grace and truth, one that brings grace upon grace upon grace. Father, I come to You in the name of Jesus. And I pray that Your Word would ring forth here. And if I've said anything that is not true, that's not in line with what you have said, Lord, please forgive me and cause it to come to naught. But Lord, those things that are true, oh, Holy Spirit, would you convince us of them, help us embrace them, help us revel in them. And for the person who hasn't trusted Christ, Lord, I pray that you would convince them of their need for Jesus and his willingness, his open arms, ready now to receive them if they will put aside their own righteousness and earning their own salvation, if they'll trust Him and Him alone. And Lord, I pray that You would give them the grace and the courage to reach out or to find someone who can explain this good gift of salvation to them even more clearly. I pray this in Jesus' name and for His glory. Amen. Well, God bless you, church, and I pray that He will be with you until we meet again, Lord willing, next week. God bless.